Hi everyone, I wanted to do a little walkthrough of this visualization that I made of bank failures. Uh, so this is showing the FDIC reported bank failures you know, from about 2002 to present. So you can see the 2008 to 2009 financial crisis and the fallout from that, a lot of the regional banks that failed uh, and consolidation. And of course the three recent bank failures of First Republic, Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. Um, you know, this is kind of an unusual visual form. Um, it's called a dodge plot or a bee swarm, um, but it's nice for showing both kind of the overall distribution, you know, this cluster of failures that happened as a result of the earlier financial crisis. Um, and you can see not just the overall distribution, but the individual components of that, you know, the individual banks and their relative sizes, right? So the, the big Washington Mutual Bank here, um, and IndyMac and Colonial, and then a lot of smaller banks, many, many, many smaller banks that failed, you know, as a fallout of that overall crisis. Um, and comparing that, you know, that distribution of bank failures to the three large recent failures gives you a little bit of context, although, of course, doesn't explain what's going to happen or why. Um, but I think it's, it's an interesting sort of almost physical analogy uh, when you're looking at a distribution of events over time as these bank failures. So I wanted to show how I made this on Observable, uh, and I thought we could start by looking at the data sets that are behind it. Um, so as I said, you know, this is reported by the FDIC. Um, so there's a uh, FDIC website here where you can go um, and, and get the list of reported bank failures that they publish. There's a convenient download data link here. Um, so we can go then make a new notebook and call it bank failures. And then the first thing we're gonna do is just drag this file here over to the file attachment uh, pane. And then we are going to insert it into the notebook. And you can see you know, this, this table that we get uh, from the CSV file, including the bank name, um, you know, as well as the, the city and state where it came from here, like First Republic in San Francisco. Um, some additional information that we don't care about in particular, but you know, the, the closing date here, um, as well as the approximate number of assets which we're gonna use to size those circles. Um, but we're gonna have to do a little work before we can start connecting this directly to our data. Um, so we can see looking at this approximate assets column. So this is a string, there's a dollar sign, uh, commas, um, that sort of thing. So we're actually going to need to turn that into a number uh, before we can start to visualize it. Because even though you know, we try to do a little bit of, of inference to understand what the types are, we're going to have to do a little bit more work here uh, before we can start to pipe this into a visualization. So I'm going to take this usage code here. And rather than using this data table cell, I am going to start with a JavaScript cell. Um, now, if I take this, you can see this is kind of the JavaScript representation of the same data. Each of the bank failures is an object with a bunch of fields here. Um, and you can see, like I said, that these are strings. That's what this quote means around here. So we're going to have to do a little bit of parsing to turn those strings into a number. Um, same thing with dates here. We're going to want to parse those dates and turn those into a date object. Uh, and then we can start to work with this data. So what I'm going to do here is I'll call this uh, fails um, so we can give it a name um, and then we'll say data equals await something like that. Um, and so this is the same thing that we had before. Um, it's just giving me some space where I can start to do some processing of this data. Um, so one of the things that I can do or one of the methods that I can use in order to process this data is to call map. So this data is an array. Um, I mean, I can call this fails here if that helps, but there's kind of like an intermediate representation of the data that we're going to go through first. Okay, so map calls a function for each element in the array. Um, so if I just return D here, you know, nothing happens. I'm just taking the input data object and returning the same object. This map is not doing anything. Uh, but now I can start to kind of pull out these values and do stuff with them. Um, so again, if I look at these fields here, we're going to want to pull out a few of them. Okay, so I can say const uh, name, or maybe, yeah, const name equals D of this field. Um, so now if I just pull that out, you can see that I've just pulled the name columns out of these objects. 
So we can start to work with the individual columns, kind of derive new columns. What else? We're going to need the closing date. So I'll pull that one out. Const date equals D of this. Need some quotes. Um, and then we're going to pull out the approximate assets field. And we'll say const assets equals D of that. So now if I say name date assets, you know, I have pulled out the three fields that I care about. And then we can start to work with those um, to clean them up a little bit more. So one of the things that I want to do is drop the state, uh, the, the city and state. So I can just get the name. Um, so one of the ways that we can do that, so we can call this, I don't know, full name. And then I can say, um, you know, parts or maybe like names. Well, let's just call it names for now. And I'll say full name dot split on comma. Okay, so now you can see that the name is pulled out into three, uh, an element of three strings. Um, the first part is the bank name. Um, the second part is the city, and the third part is the uh, state code. So if we just want the name, then we can just pull out the first of those. That's bracket zero. Um, so now we have just the names of the banks. Uh, now we're going to want to parse these dates. So normally what I use for parsing dates, I mean, sometimes you can kind of get away with it and just pass it directly to the date constructor. Um, that looks like it's kind of doing approximately what I want, although it's showing it in local time. I'm in Pacific time, um, which is not usually what I want. I would rather have it in UTC time so that it's the same for whoever's looking at my uh, visualization around the world. Um, so I can use D3 for that. So there is a, let's see, UTC format is what we can start with. Um, and then you pass it in one of these format strings. So there's a bunch of like percent codes. So often what I do is I just pass in uh, a new date so that I can make sure that I am producing a format that's the same as the format that I expect. Um, so I'm gonna do percent M. I think that is, uh, so that's the month number. So I want percent A, that's the date. Let's see, B, okay, percent B is the short month name. Uh, percent capital Y is the four digit year, but I want the lowercase one, so that's lowercase percent Y. And then percent D is going to give me the month number, um, but I'll actually use percent minus D, uh, which gives me the one digit, so it doesn't pad it with a zero. Um, so now, rather than UTC format, I'm gonna change that to UTC parse. And then we can pass in you know, one of these dates just to make sure that it's doing the correct thing. Yeah, so 3 Mar 17, uh, 2017 um, So this is more of the ISO 8601 format. You know, if, if the FDIC provided these dates uh, in the standard format, uh, then I wouldn't have to do quite as much work, um, but they don't. So I'm gonna write a little bit of glue code here. So I'll call that parse date equals that. Uh, and now we put in that as parse date. Uh, and so now we have nice date objects. You can see they changed from that kind of blue color to a slightly more greenish blue. The drop the quotes, they all have this standard format there. So that's an indication that these are now date objects. Okay, so lastly, we're gonna write um, some parsing code for these assets here. So the dollar signs. So I'll just call this like parse assets for now. Uh, and you can see that's gonna fail. And then we're gonna write a function here called parse assets. Uh, and it takes an input, and for now I'll just return input. So that's not going to do anything, um, but it means I can write some code in here that is going to process that. So one of the first things I can do is I can call trim, and that is going to remove the spaces at the beginning or the end. In this case, we only have a space at the end. Um, I can also replace the leading dollar sign, and I'm going to do that, well, there's a few ways I can do that. I could just slice off the first character, but usually it's slightly safer in this case to use a regular expression. So I'm going to replace uh, a dollar sign that if, if the string starts with a dollar sign, I'm going to replace that. So that's what that looks like. Okay, so now I have this. Uh, it looks like I'm also gonna need to drop the commas here. So I can write that as replace comma 
and I'm going to the G modifier is going to replace all commas because there might be more than one comma. Um, although these are in millions, and I don't think there are any banks that failed with trillions yet, so it's probably optimistic to, to replace more than one comma. I think we only have to replace commas in this data set so far, at least. Uh, all right, so we're going to do that. Uh, and then lastly, I'm going to call number function here, which is just going to coerce those values into numbers. So now I finally have uh, my data in the form that I want. Uh, and if I wanted to, I could you know, write this in a slightly shorter way just to make it fit on one line, which is nice. Um, and then what else can I do? I can uh, hide the output of it, but it's not helpful. So that makes it a little bit shorter. Okay, so we can do that. Um, I can also go back. Um, Let's see what else I can do. I can take this data table cell and I will switch it to showing the table that we constructed um, rather than just sort of the raw input. Uh, and then I will hide this little display here. So now we have you know, our JavaScript code for loading the data and we have a nice little table uh, that shows the values that we have in here. Okay, so we've done our data prep work uh, and now we can start to visualize it. So I'm gonna make another JavaScript cell and I'm gonna call plot.plot. .plot. And we are going to start with just a dot mark. Um, so I close out some of this. Well, you can you can read the description if you want. Um, the dot mark um, is going to draw circles, and we can place them in X and Y, and also set what the radius is. Um, so the first argument is going to be the data set that we pass in, which we've called fails. Uh, and then we're going to specify, well, to start, let's just do X is date. Okay, so. This is a one dimensional dot plot. Each of these circles corresponds to the bank failures um, and it's just showing the, the dates. So already you can kind of get a sense of where the activity is happening in this data set. You know, this is basically a solid black area from all of these dots that are overlapping, but it's a little bit hard to see sort of exactly what's happening. Um, and of course there's no size, like all of the dots are sized the same amount. Um, so we can, change that by saying R is assets. Um, so now our circles are sized proportionally to the assets that were seized by the FDIC. Um, now it's, I'm going to increase the width here a little bit to make it a bit bigger. Um, I'm going to increase the height to make it a bit taller, give us some more breathing room. Uh, and I'll set a little bit of insets here um, so that these circles on the outside are not cropped. Okay, so you can already start to see a little bit of this coming together. Um, but what I wanted to mention about these sizes um, is that in plot the R scale, which is used uh, for the R channel on dots, is a square root scale. And so that means that these circles are sized proportionally, the area is proportional to the assets. Um, it's not a linear scaling, which would exaggerate um, the larger values. So you can uh, test that if, we, if I wanted to override the type, you know, if I set that to be a linear scale, uh, you can see that the small ones disappear, uh, whereas the square root scale gives you proportional area. So, but you just get that by default. You don't need to do that. Um, so I can remove that. But one thing I, I might want to do is increase the range on this um, if I want larger circles. So I think the maximum size here, you know, looks to be about 25 pixels in radius. So I'm going to increase that up to, I don't know, something like 80, uh, maybe 60, something like that. Okay. So that's um, kind of the X layout of our plot. Um, and now we need kind of the Y layout because we don't want these circles to be overlapping. It's still kind of too hard to see them. Um, now, one thing I could try um, is if I remove this again, just go back to these all the same size, is I could use the stack layout. So if I did stack Y like this, um, you know, then I'm starting to get my dots that are stacked on top of each other. Um, but the challenge with this is that stacking only works when the dates are exactly the same, right? So if they failed on the same day, you know, then they're going to be stacked vertically. So there were, I guess it looks like about eight banks that failed. Um, you know, I, I should use the stack Y2 here really, which rather than getting the midpoint. So, you, okay, so you can see that there was one day where nine banks failed at the same time uh, around the end of 2009. Um, now we can do a bunch of processing here in order to sort of group uh, the days a little bit closer together. 
um, but what I want to do instead um, is use the dodge y transform, um, which doesn't really care. Um, you don't have to specify sort of exactly how you want to group the values um, when you're stacking them. It looks at the radius of the dots and, and uses that radius in order to stack them. So that works really well when you have a variable radius like we do, right? So here they're all the same. They're, you know, three pixel radius or something like that. Um, but if we change them so that the radius is proportional to the assets, we get something like this instead. So you can see that this looks kind of similar to the final visualization that we want. And again, I can increase that. Um, let me check what I, I used in my other chart. Yeah, so I think I did about 80 instead. So slightly bigger. Now one downside of the uh, dodge plot is that it currently doesn't, or the dodge transform, which we're using here to lay out these circles, um, is that it doesn't um, automatically set the height of the plot. So we have to do a little bit of massaging here to make sure that things aren't getting cropped off. So I think about 680, 660, something like that. Yeah, that'll do it. Um, and then these are getting cropped off a little bit too. So I'm gonna increase that. Yeah, so you wanna make sure that your circles aren't getting cut off. Uh, you know, then it would be misleading. I mean, there is another thing you can do where you can set the, the overflow to be visible. And then, you know, if I had it to be too short here, you could, <laughs> well, it kind of goes off the page. So you can you can kind of have it extend a little bit. Um, but what I would rather do here is just, just make it tall enough to fit everything. So something like that. Okay, so you can see kind of the basic layout here that we had of our plot. Um, and there's a bunch of polishing that we could now add to that. Um, so one of the things is I could set a fill color. So if I want them to be gray, I can do that. Um, I can add a stroke to go on the outline here. Um, and then maybe I wanna do a little bit of separation between these circles. So these circles are touching right now, which is the default behavior um, for the dodge transform, I think. Or maybe there's a default padding of, okay, yeah. So there's a default padding of, it looks like about one pixel. If I set the padding to zero, you can see now they're, they're touching. Um, but what we're gonna wanna do is increase that a little bit more. So I'm gonna use a value of two uh, put that stroke back in uh, and then I actually want to use a slightly thinner stroke of just one there. Okay, so that's that's the values that I used and again like because we increased the padding It's actually getting cut off a little bit here. So I'm gonna bump that up a little more um, So what else can we do? I can put in a title here and If I just say name uh, Now when I mouse over this I get the name of the bank that failed um, I can write a function instead. Um, that'll do the same thing. Um, but the nice thing is now I can put in multiple values. So I'm going to do name d.assets like that. So now if I mouse over it, yeah, I can see the, the size of the assets um, at the time of failure. Um, if I want, I can kind of clean that up a little bit. So these are in millions so i'm going to divide by a thousand to get billions uh, and then i'm going to say two fixed one uh, which is going to format it with one fractional digit of precision uh, at b at the end to show billions so yeah so now i can see 32.0 billion 27 13 okay so now i've got the titles um what else could we do okay so we can throw a rule here uh well, actually, we don't want to do a rule here because, as I mentioned kind of at the beginning, there isn't actually a Y scale here. Um, the Y axis is not meaningful. It's just like the layout that we needed in order to stack these circles. So there's no Y scale here. There's no Y axis. We shouldn't really try to use Y values in our plot. But what we can do is we can put a frame on our plot, which just draws a box around it. Um, we can see there's that's bleeding into the margin a little bit, which is interesting. Um, and then if I say anchor bottom, um, I could just draw a line across the bottom. Um, so that's one way that we can draw a little line there across the bottom. Okay. Now I think the last thing I'd like to do um, is to put some text labels on. So I'm gonna start by just copying everything that we just did for dot. And I'm gonna change that from dot to text. Um, and I'm gonna get rid of, let's see this fill. I'm gonna get rid of the stroke and the title. 
um, but I'm going to leave the other values the same because these values are used by the dodge layout. Um, so we're going to want them to be the same if we're going to put a text label on top of the dots. So if I just do that, um, okay, so now you can see kind of a hairy plot, uh, which is all of the text labels are being drawn here. And by default, what you're seeing is just a number. So we didn't say what text we wanted to show. Um, and it's not smart enough to guess that we want to show the name or something like that. So it's just showing a number, um, which is a little bit interesting. I mean, you can see the order in the data set, which is reverse chronological order. So this zero is the first Republic bank. Uh, and then, you know, going back in time from there, like we saw in the table. So one thing I can do is I can say text name instead. Um, so now we have the names of the banks that are being shown here. Um, and you can see that we can't label all of the circles. Um, you know, we just won't be able to see the dots. Um, so what we can do is we can throw a filter on this. So I'm going to use the filter transform, uh, which takes a test function. Uh, you can see kind of an example here. So first I'll write it just to return true. Um, and then the second argument is going to be, you know, the options that we would otherwise pass in. So that's just going to be our dodge transform. So if I do that, you know, nothing has changed. Um, but if we go in here, we can take our d.assets and we can say, you know, assets is greater than, now remember these are in millions. So if I do billion, um, you know, that's already cutting out a lot of the data. Um, if I do, I don't know, 2 billion or something like that, um, that's quite a bit better. I don't remember exactly what I used before. Oh yeah, so there's other, um, there's another thing that we can do, which is we can do kind of a conditional formatting for the name here. So again, like I, I specified before, we can put this in as a function. Um, so if I do something like that, you know, now I'm seeing both the, the name of the bank and the number of assets or the quantity of assets. Um, but we can do something like, you know, if d.assets is greater than, I don't know, 10, billion, uh, then we'll do this full name. And otherwise we will do like just the, uh, the size, the number of assets, uh, cause that's nice and short. Okay. So that you can see, so you can see down here, these are just some numbers. Um, and actually we can drop the B to make it fit even a little bit better. Uh, what else? Oh yeah. I want to put in a line width five. And so what that's going to do, it's going to wrap, uh, wrap the labels. So if they're more than five EMs wide, um, it's going to automatically wrap it, which helps it fit inside of these small circles. Okay. And then the last touch, um, I want to set a color here and then we'll put a stroke on it. Um, and so I made it red just so you can see it. And this is going to provide a little kind of punch out effect, um, so that it's easier for us to read the text. And if I change that to be DDD, which is the fill color, um, you can see it becomes easier to read these labels here, even when they're overlapping. I mean, it's still a little bit challenging. We could maybe, you know, increase uh, the filter there to just show a few smaller ones. Yeah, okay. So yeah, so this is how I made the chart. Um, there's a few other things that we could do, um, but I'm going to kind of leave it there. Um, so one is you can change it to sort by date rather than sorting by size, which changes the layout of the Dodge transform. I think when you sort by size, it does a little bit of a better job showing the sequence of events that kind of starts by placing dots at the bottom and then building them on, on top of that. Um, whereas when you sort by size and you place the largest dot first, it's a little bit more ambiguous about which event happened first, right? So Indy Mac failed before Washington Mutual, but that's a little bit hard to see because the size of Washington Mutual is so large here. Um, so that's done just by saying sort date uh, or sort undefined for the Dodge transform. Uh, and then the last thing is adjusting for inflation. So the, you know, the numbers that you get from the FDIC, that's just the number of assets in billions or millions that at the time they were seized. Um, but whenever you're looking at money, you know, the value of money changes over time. Um, and so you often want to normalize it to some baseline. And so in this case, uh, I downloaded a different data set from Fred. Uh, you can also get it from the BLS, which is the consumer price index or CPI. 
Um, but there are other ways you could normalize this data or normalize the, the value of money. So for example, you could compare it to GDP or you could compare it to M1 and M2, which are measures of the monetary supply. Uh, I'm gonna leave that for your own um, research. If you wanna investigate how I did that in the notebook, um, go take a look. Um, but yeah, I hope that was a helpful little tour of how I put together this visualization uh, using Observable. So thanks for watching. Cheers.